Good morning, members, guests. I'd like to call the meeting of the Environmental Resources Policy and Finance Committee to order. We do have a quorum. Uh, we got the minutes before us for January 24th. Representative Sundin, would you move the most minutes, please? Mr. Chairman, I move the <laughs> minutes of uh, January 24th uh, of this committee. Thank you. Any additions or corrections to the minutes? Hearing none, the minutes are approved. We are on TV today, so make sure your ties are straight. Um, first item on the agenda, uh, Commissioner Thornton is here, and uh, he's going to take us through the uh, uh, Volkswagen settlement, and I see Ms. Gothier is here too, so please introduce yourselves and uh, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is David Thornton. I'm Assistant Commissioner at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Greta Gothier, Legislative Director at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And if I may just point out to members, we did pass out a fact sheet this morning. So if that might be a handy reference for folks. So, Mr. Chairman, um, thank you for inviting us here today to talk about the Volkswagen settlement. This has been uh, in the news for the last uh, six or seven months. Um, there's um, a lot of information swirling around and there are multiple court cases involving Volkswagen and what they did with diesel engines. Uh, but I'm here primarily to talk about the environmental mitigation settlement and how it affects Minnesota. But if you have questions about some of the other uh, issues, I can, I can try to answer them as well. Thank you, Commissioner. And I think that the focus uh, is on what's going on here in Minnesota. The court case is the court case and I'm not a lawyer, so. And I'd like to stay awake. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. So what happened? Um, Volkswagen intentionally tampered with their diesel engines, their two liter and their three liter engines to fool emissions testing equipment. The result of that uh, was that they exceeded their tailpipe emission standards by more than 30 times for nitrogen oxides uh, over the past seven years. This affects model years uh, starting with 2009. Um, nationwide, there are about 580,000 of these vehicles on the roads. Um, in Minnesota, we believe that there were around 9,300 um, of these diesel Volkswagens registered in the state. And the amount of excess emissions in Minnesota is, is that has occurred over, the, over time is the equivalent of having an additional 300,000 cars on the road. So it's a significant amount of air pollution. Um, there was a nationwide lawsuit brought against uh, Volkswagen for uh, these violations, initiated by the state of California and joined by US EPA and the Department of Justice. They charged that Volkswagen illegally tampered with their emission control systems and falsified federal emission tests. And again, this is um, for the two liter and three liter engines. Volkswagen essentially had some software built into their computers on board these cars so that the, um, they programmed the vehicles to bypass emission control equipment when the vehicles were being tested. And, um, and then uh, they ran with a little bit more energy and power when they were being driven by their owners. And this went on, as I said, for many years, going back to uh, as far as 2009. Um, we weren't following any of this case. We weren't involved in it directly. We didn't have anything to, to do with the settlement. We weren't consulted in any way. So when the the draft settlement came out in July. It actually caught us and most states completely by surprise. Um, the environmental mitigation settlement that uh, Volkswagen agreed to uh, is going to cost them $14.9 billion. There's, there's other settlements that, are, that they've agreed to as well. They've agreed to a penalty. There's some other things that are still pending. But for the environmental mitigation settlement, the total is $14.9 uh, billion. Uh, $10 billion of that is for the repurchase or the repair of the defective vehicles that they sold. Volkswagen is already in the process of buying back these subject vehicles, which will then 
uh, be destroyed and recycled. Uh, the buyback price that they are offering is generous. It's above what you would call a blue book price. Uh, and I think that the hope is that, that most of the owners of these vehicles will sell them back to Volkswagen, but they can choose to have the vehicle repaired and continue to operate it. Mr. Chairman, if I may add here that this $10 billion is going through Volkswagen dealerships directly to the people that bought the cars, the defective cars. It's not connected with our agency at all. Thank you. <clears throat> and then, Mr. Chairman, $2 billion of the settlement is for zero emission vehicle infrastructure. Uh, Volkswagen is, is uh, largely responsible for that on their own. Um, that's something that they're going to be investing uh, themselves. Uh, states are not uh, involved in that directly. Um, the zero emission vehicle infrastructure that they can uh, spend that on includes electric vehicles as well as hydrogen powered uh, fuel cell vehicles. Um, we have taken it upon ourselves to have a couple of conversations with the folks at Volkswagen that are responsible for this portion of the settlement. and. Um, we, we wanted to make sure that uh, they should not overlook the Midwest and Minnesota in particular as they're making these investments in infrastructure um, uh, because they're not required to spread this out in any particular way. Um, the, one, the thing that we have learned is that they are interested in, in um, investments all across the country. Uh, they are focusing only on electric vehicles because uh, Volkswagen has decided to stop making diesel vehicles altogether and uh, they're going all in on electric vehicles. So their, uh, their intentions for this uh, electric vehicle infrastructure is going to be, um, or this infrastructure, zero emission, excuse me, vehicle infrastructure is going to be all electric. So, Mr. Thornton, when you had that conversation with uh, whomever you said uh, to not forget about, I'll say, the Midwest and Minnesota. What response did you get from them? Uh, Mr. Chairman, they're interested. They, um, they want to start their investments in places where they think they're going to get early wins. And frankly, that's going to be states that have um, already invested more currently in, in infrastructure for electric vehicles and have more electric vehicles on the road. But they're very interested in, in Minnesota. We're developing uh, a vehicle infrastructure, electric vehicle infrastructure plan that is what I would call funding ready, identifying places around the state where we, we need to have charging available if people are gonna travel from here to Fargo or from here to uh, Graham Ozone. Ray um, um, and such. Um, and we're gonna be sharing that with them. Uh, they're also following the fact that uh, Interstate 94 has been designated a, a zero emission vehicle corridor by um, uh, Federal Highway and they're, one of the things that they're interested in is trying to get some of their infrastructure uh, installed along those uh, zero emission highway corridors in the country. So I think, I think we're going to be okay there. Thank you. So um, then the final large bullet on this slide is that $2.9 billion is reserved for states, uh, which includes Puerto Rico and <laughs> tribes. And this is money that is to make up for the air pollution that has been coming from the engines that, uh, um, and vehicles that Volkswagen sold. Um, it's, it's, it's mitigation. It's to mitigate the pr pollution problem that they have created through their actions. <coughs> the amount of money that gets distributed to states is based on the number of affected vehicles registered in each jurisdiction. Um, so each state gets a different amount of money. It just turns out that Minnesotans were not as enamored with Volkswagen diesel uh, vehicles as some other states. So the per capita, we had less than, say, Maryland or, or, or uh, other states of our size, similar size and population. So. So, um, some states our size are going to be getting more money. Some states are going to get less. California, by virtue of their population and size, gets the most. I think their award here is about <clears throat> something like $300 million. Um, uh, before we go to the next slide, the Representative Metze has a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I was just wondering if we have more details on the scrapping part of it. To me, it's... <coughs> 
just seems kind of ridiculous <coughs> that we take vehicles that work and not try to repair them. Yeah, Mr. Commissioner Thornton. Mr. Chairman, Representative, I don't, uh, but we'll get some information for you on that. Okay. Thank you. Proceed, please. So uh, the way this works is that the federal court has set up a, mitigating, a mitigation trust of $2.9 billion for states and tribes. The estimated amount of money that Minnesota is eligible to receive out of that trust is $47 million. You may have heard a different number in the news uh, in the past. That was solely the two liter vehicle number. They uh, recently have settled on the three liter vehicles in December. And so the, the amount of money that we're eligible for is a little more than uh, the $43.6 million that uh, people have been talking about. It's, it's right at $47 million. The way this is going to operate is that the court will appoint a trustee to disperse uh, the, the funds to states and tribes, uh, which we have to apply for. Um, and so dollars will flow directly from the trustee to the state, uh, to the tri uh, our tribe, and to the grantee. There are strict limits in the settlement as to how this money can be used. And um, again, to reiterate, the goal of this whole mitigation trust is to make up for the illegal excess pollution from Volkswagen engines that have already happened and continues to happen as, as long as they're on the roads. Mr. Chairman, if I may, yes. um, just one clarification. The states and tribes also includes the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. Yep. Thank you. Um, question on the uh, <clears throat> bullet point there on the strict, uh, strictly limiting the expenditures, um, and you have to apply for those. Uh, what are they allowing you then for, I'll say, administrative costs, and, and what are you projecting? Uh, Mr. <coughs> Chairman, um, for <coughs> overhead for operating, a program like this, they're allowing up to 15% of the state's um, uh, amount, and we have not uh, gotten into the details of trying to figure out what we're going to be uh, suggesting for the state. So, uh, Commissioner Thornton, when you do uh, get to that point, when I think we'll have you back here to uh, uh, inform us as to how you're going to administer it and FTEs and all that sort of stuff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We'd be happy to. Representative Hornstein has a question. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, to, to your uh, <coughs> point about the, uh, the, the bullet points here and, and uh, eligible uh, projects, um, th the last one says matching funds for projects eligible under the Diesel Emission Reduction Act. What would be uh, an example or two of a, a project eligible under that uh, statute? Commissioner Thornton. Mr. Chairman, Representative Hornstein, the uh, Diesel Emission Reduction Act is something that's been in place for a number of years, and we've been involved in getting grants from EPA um, for that. Um, I'll just explain what's what, what is uh, not included in the bullets above this that would be included in that, and that's essentially off-road construction equipment. The, uh, the mitigation settlement did not allow for retrofitting or repowering off-road construction equipment, um, which actually we think is a flaw in the settlement, but <coughs> they didn't ask us for our opinion. Um, so it is possible, though, to do some uh, emission reduction projects with off-road construction equipment through the matching fund with this DARA thing. And, um, as far as the details of how that would work, we're not clear yet. Uh, thank you. And then, you know, while you're here, and I, I think you're one of our foremost experts on this, um, and this came up yesterday at a hearing on, on transit, but uh, I wanted to get your perspective and, and, and how this mitigation money may potentially help us. But uh, I know in the past our region has um, uh, been in, uh, close to being a non-attainment area. And, um, you know, my understanding is if, if we, if we're in that category, then then we have to pay uh, fines and, and other things to, uh, to the federal government. Um, I, I understand we're not as close as we once were. Is that the case, Commissioner Thornton? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Hornstein, we're still relatively close to becoming a non-attainment area, um, but. I'll go back to the first slide or one of the earlier slides. You might recall I mentioned that the. The penalties are all about their excess emissions of nitrogen oxides. 
And that's not a pollutant that is of concern to us as diesel particulate, which is clearly a problem. Uh, it's a carcinogen or a potential carcinogen, and uh, particulates um, exacerbate asthma and things like that. Um, the beauty of this program, even though it's all focused on reducing nitrogen oxides, is that everything you do to reduce nitrogen oxides is also going to reduce diesel particulate for the most part. So there's a lot of multiple benefits that we're going to see from this program. Follow up, Representative Hornstein. Uh, thank you. Representative Waginius. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. I, I've had a conversation with uh, a utility that's interested in helping its communities buy electric school buses, not retrofitted buses, but actually manufactured uh, buses. And um, so I, I want to ask a couple questions about that. Would uh, they be eligible for some of the funds for, say, over the cost of a normal school bus? Um, would, would that be an eligible? Commissioner Thornton. Mr. Chairman, um, members, yes. Um, we believe that uh, either repowering or uh, retrofitting or replacing an existing school bus or a transit bus for that matter with uh, uh, a cleaner burning uh, engine, whether it's a natural gas engine or an electric <coughs> engine would be eligible for funding under this. Or Representative Wagenius. Now, was there some conversation in this court case about disadvantaged communities um, Commissioner Thornton. Mr. Chairman, uh, yes. Uh, the settlement asks states and tribes to uh, address how their proposed <laughs> use of the funds will uh, affect disadvantaged communities. It does not lay out how <laughs> that should be done, but it does say that we should consider that. Representative Waginius. Well, Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, so then there's the potential for putting electric school buses in quarters where we have more air pollution than in other quarters. And if that's the case, um, what, I, what concerns me is if several different communities want to apply for a grant or whatever, um, they don't have the power of being united and being able to purchase at a discount. And anytime you buy more than one, you're going to be able to strike a better bargain. Is that something you can coordinate, or does it have to be done by grant, or do you have some room there to um, be helpful to communities? Commissioner Thornton. Um, Mr. Chairman, you know, I think that's a really good question. And, and it applies to other things in this category as well, because the more you're going to be purchasing, the lower the price that you're going to get. And um, so it does raise a bunch of questions as to how we might proceed in, in organizing some of this and whether there might be some uh, power in working collectively with some of our neighboring states or maybe not necessarily neighboring states, but others uh, to, you know, increase the power of the money that we have. So that's one thing that we'll, we will be trying to, to look at. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Representative Torkelson, now hopefully this isn't about a new combine. <coughs> well, actually, uh, it kind of is because uh, my question uh, is, I see no mention whatsoever of agricultural equipment in any of these lists. Uh, as you know, we do use quite a bit of diesel uh, power in agriculture. Uh, and I'm just curious as to what, uh, why, why that's not being considered, or maybe I'm lucky it's not being considered. Uh, My new combine does have that <laughs> DEF thing in it, so it, it smells real nice. Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, no. I, agricultural equipment is off-road. It would not qualify. So is construction equipment. And just like construction equipment, we have asked why and have not received a good answer. Um, 
I don't know what to say. Ms. Gauthier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Representative Torkelson. So um, this, is a, this is a private settlement of private funds from a private company. And so the court got to say whatever they wanted. And so they were very, very specific. And that's about all we can say. It, we, states don't have any ability to change that. Representative Parkinson. I've had a revelation, Mr. Chair. Volkswagen does not make combines. Yep. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And, they, and they wear their own shoes, too. <laughs> Representative Newberger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Commissioner, as, as, I, as I track along here with, with you, um, I just have a question. Do you, do you intend, does the agency intend to use any of this funding to expand their enforcement uh, of, uh, of addressing these emissions uh, in other areas? Uh, or is all of this going to go towards infrastructure uh, and, um, and upgrades? Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Newberger, none of this money can be used for enforcement purposes. It all has to go to projects on this list. Mr. Chairman, if I may, oh, it's, yeah. think yep. of it as a pass-through grant, Mr. Chairman and, and Representative Newberger. This is just passing through to the court wants these vehicles off the road or retrofitted. Follow up. Representative Hornstein. Thanks. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, what is the, is there a plan uh, in, in terms of rolling this out in a more public way and involving the public and, um, I mean, I think there'll be a lot of different stakeholders. Um, do, do you have a, a plan for that? Commissioner. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Representative, uh, I'll get to that in a couple of slides if you'd, okay. if you'd like to wait. Okay, sure. So um, we've already talked about a number of the items on this list. Uh, this, is, this is it. We can only, this money can only be used on, on the items on this list. Um, the only thing I want to highlight that we haven't already talked about is the second to last bullet, light duty zero emission vehicle supply equipment. Um, this, the settlement specifically says uh, up to 15% of the funds can be used for uh, um, zero emission, <clears throat> excuse me, vehicle uh, infrastructure. Um, and so one, we've, we've had a lot of interest from parties about using some of this money for electric vehicle charging stations. Um, so I just, I just wanted to flag that for folks. Chair Garofalo will like that. Yeah. So the next slide, um, a little bit about how this is, we believe this will work in the state. Um, the, tr the settlement requires um, governors or I suppose tribal chairs um, to apply to be a beneficiary to receive uh, their portion of the money on behalf of the state. Uh, the governor has to identify uh, the state agency that will ask, act as the primary fiscal agent. Um, and the governor has um, <coughs> indicated that that would be the pollution control agency. Um, and the, the role of that fiscal agent would be to develop uh, a mitigation uh, trust plan that we submit to the trustee that has to be approved. Uh, eventually send out RFPs, requests for uh, proposals, uh, for projects that would be eligible for the funding, and then to award and manage the grants. Uh, I think it's important to note that the trustee um, has to approve each emission reduction project. Um, so they're going to be very carefully watching how this money is used. Um, so we have little discretion within the state for, for that. Um, grantees can be local governments, they can be private companies, they can be nonprofits, and they can also be state and tribal governments. Um, after consultation with uh, Minnesota Management and Budget, um, it was decided that the appropriate way to sec uh, accept these funds in the state is under the authority of 16A.013 which is titled Acceptance of Gifts. And that, um, that section of statute specifically addresses funds coming from trusts. So this is, this is not federal money, this is not state money, this is private money. Um, 
with a lot of strings attached. Um, and uh, so that's how we uh, plan to proceed. Um, in terms of next steps, uh, I already indicated that uh, the state must apply to, to file as a, a beneficiary. We're preparing the paperwork for that right now. Um, there is no trustee named um, yet. The uh, court is, is interviewing candidates, as I understand it. it. It may be soon or it may be months before they select a trustee. Once the trustee is selected, uh, the trustee will need to take some time to see whether there's some tweaks that need to be made in the process. And, and hopefully the trustee will provide states with a lot more detail about what needs to be in a mitigation plan and, and how to proceed because uh, we're operating sort of in the fog at the moment. Um, we do plan extensive public participation. We have a website already. Um, there's a, the link to that website is at the bottom of this next step slide. Um, the, there's a lot of information on that website and members of the public and others can uh, use that website to comment already. And we've already received a number of comments uh, from the public. They've all been about electric vehicles, I believe, so far. Um, we uh, intend a formal notice and comment period as well as public meetings to get input. Um, that will begin at the, towards the end of February. We're expecting this process to take many months and so we also are going to be forming a technical advisory committee because there's a lot of technical aspects of this that need to be sorted out. Uh, some of the ones that Representative Wilginius mentioned, for example, and we're going to need some smart people to help us work through this. And so uh, we expect to have a, a technical advisory committee working to help us through the summer and then on beyond into the, the actual operations of the program. Uh, we also want to uh, continue to engage with you, the legislature, during the session, and we need to figure out a good way to continue to engage with you uh, after the session is over because I expect most of the action on the initial uh, filing with the trustee and the initial mitigation plan will probably happen sometime this summer or fall. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, <clears throat> just one question on your second to the last slide. Uh, you said that the governor asked to apply, and then you also said something about possibly tribal chairs. Um, can you <laughs> elaborate on that for me a little bit? And, and, and then I have a follow-up. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. I <coughs> neglected to say that there is a separate pot of money in this mitigation trust for the tribes okay. nationwide. It's about $54 million. And um, so they have the ability to apply to the trustee on their own, each individual tribe, for some portion of that, of that money. We have been talking to our, our tribes in Minnesota and encouraging them to uh, take that path, and we've been offering any help that they want to help them do that, and we hope that they uh, do so. So then is it your understanding that <coughs> when those grants are, are, are given out to a state and a tribe that they would be two separate entities. I mean, would MPCA be involved in implementing and planning and, and deciding on how the tribe would spend those dollars? Uh, Mr. Chairman, not directly. If they want our help, we'd be happy to give them some advice, but, but no, it would be their, it would, it would be the same, set two separate pots of money. Yep. Thank you. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I'm, I think this case is important because it shows the power of enforcement, shows the power of agencies when you have a crooked company who purposefully uh, alters equipment to dodge the law. It's hard, uh, I don't think this is a case that could have been worked out over a cup of coffee, talking about it, <laughs> or with uh, cost share or voluntary compliance. There are crooked companies, not all of them, maybe only a few of them, but this is a big deal, huge deal. And <clears throat> uh, Mr. Chair, is there still other litigation going on with Volkswagen separate from this case? Commissioner. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Hansen, um, the Attorney General and other Attorneys General have sued uh, <coughs> 
Volkswagen for violating uh, state anti-tampering regulations. Um, not all states have such a regulation. I don't remember the states that are a part of that lawsuit, and that is currently pending. Follow up, and Mr. Chair, and maybe this is a question for MMB rather than you, but uh, does the state of Minnesota purchase any Volkswagen vehicles or equipment or motor? Commissioner, Ms. Gauthier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Actually, um, that would be a um, question for the Department of Administration, and we don't have somebody here from admin today, but I can um, get that information for you, unless you know. No, I was just going to say, uh, sorry, Mr. Chairman, I was just going to say that I haven't seen any Volkswagen vehicles in the fleet, but I couldn't say for sure. Representative Hanson. Mr. Chair, I think we buy American, uh, but just in case, I mean, I think there's, we talked earlier about you know, if, if enforcement and regulations don't work or they're off the table, we don't have to buy their stuff, you know. So I think it'd be helpful to find out, you know, if we're, if we're buying Volkswagen's stuff. Thank you. Um, Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So for, for better or worse, I, I am a lawyer. So um, <laughs> when uh, so when I see that the court has set up a trustee right away to me that says, you know, there's some additional fiduciary responsibilities that that trustee is going to have. And so, it, you know, that kind of says to me that the court's intent is that this money be spent really carefully. So I just wanted to kind of clarify it on this this slide. So we're in the process of applying to be a beneficiary and once you apply each individual project would have to meet these very specific bullets and are there any additional things outside of these bullets on this handout commissioner um, mr. chairman members the only thing is the state overhead cost for operating the, the effort Ms. Gauthier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Representative Beckerfin. You're right about the trustee. Um, every state or tribe or <coughs> District of Columbia or Puerto Rico has to do a plan, and the trustee can say, I like this, I don't like that, I want this, I, you know. The trustee has to approve that and all the expenditures in it before we can do anything. So, yeah, it's a situation where the trustee has, it's very much, um, private money going for private grants to do specific things. It's, yeah, it's very tied up. Follow up? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Thornton, or Ms. Gauthier, whichever one. I just want to clarify because uh, in listening, did you say that 15% would be for administration? Did I hear that right? Commissioner. Yeah, um, Mr. Chairman, up to 15%. Mr. Chair, so, so you're not really clear on that yet, but then 15% would be for the zero emission? Up, up to 15% can go towards zero emission infrastructure. So th these, are, these are things that we still need to work out and get some in, input from uh, the public and other experts. Ms. Gauthier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Representative Green. So the up to 15% for administrative, we're anticipating that we will, well, we know we're going to have a lot of grants that we'll be making with this money. I mean, all, all of, almost all of the money will be grants. So grant administration and management, making sure that the grantees report back because we'll have to account to the trustee for how the money was spent. Um, things like that are the administrative 15% and then the electric vehicle percent, uh, 15% is is one of the things on the list that we can spend the money on too. We just don't know yet um, the details about what our administrative costs will look like. Representative Green. Well, well, thank you for clarifying that. I guess the and when I was looking through all the, for lack of a better term, the hoops you're going to have to jump through just to administer the money, mm -hmm. it looks like probably the 15% will be used up pretty fast. Now, when you're going around the state and uh, and doing the um, for the public participation, uh, is that coming out of this fund as well? Commissioner, Ms. Gauthier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Representative Green, 
Um, the costs for us to hold listening sessions and community input sessions and so forth around the state, which you're right, we really want to do that. That would be part of our administrative cost of getting this money out to the grantees for the specific purposes that it can be spent on. Representative Green. And then the other question is now the tribes uh, have their own their own pool of money that they can draw from. Will they also have access to the $47 million from Minnesota then? No. Ms. Gauthier. Commissioner. Uh, um, actually, I think that they they could be uh, applicants for some of that money. Um, I think a consideration would be whether or not they availed themselves of the, the, the special pool of tribal money. So that's something that we'll be looking at. Uh, excuse me, Representative Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess the, the point I'm trying to get across is uh, I'm not going to say that, that one of those is bad or not or the administration costs are out of line. I'm just saying that. You know, we're going to be start looking at projects here, and if, if things go the way they always do around here, we're going to have probably uh, $450 million worth of requests, and this money is going to be gone in very short order. So I think it would really uh, uh, be good for this committee and other committees to keep a close watch on this because otherwise it could be gone before we know it, and we may not get what we're really looking for. So, Thank you, Representative Green. Uh, Ms. Gauthier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman um, and members. So the, the way this is set up, because these are private funds going through a trustee to make up for past pollution, um, it's not going to be something that would run as a bill in front of the legislature. It's going to be a, a separate process because the court set it up that way. So it's going to be something that is going to be treated as a gift, like Assistant Commissioner Thornton said, because it's private money coming into the state technically as a gift from a trustee. So it, it wouldn't be any different than if the Bill Gates Foundation gave us money through their um, foundation to do a specific thing in Minnesota. So there's all kinds of laws, federal and state, that when you receive a gift with strings attached that you have to follow all those strings. And so we've got those plus the court. So it's not gonna be, um, it isn't something that the court set up to come through the traditional appropriation process of like a tribe or a territory or Puerto Rico or a state. If that helps, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I do understand that and I wasn't, and I wasn't su uh, suggesting that we, that we put legislative approval on this, but I was saying that we should watch it and, and closely and, uh, and make our recommendations. So yeah, I understand that. Thanks. And Representative Green, to that point, I, that's part of the reason why we have this hearing today is because I do think that we, uh, as elected officials and representing our constituents, that we, that we should have some input into this. Commissioner. Yeah, and Mr. Chairman, that goes to the point I made earlier that we need to, we need to continue, we need to continue to be engaged during session, but we need to figure out a good way to keep engaged off session because that's when a lot of this will probably happen. Thank you. Um, Representative uh, Clark, we got to move on here, folks, too. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to double check. Uh, if I um, am correct, I think there's several other car companies, manufacturers that have recently in the new, appeared in the news with some of the same issues, right? And I'm just wondering, is that something you um, can anticipate any costs for, or been thinking about, and, and what your information is on that, Commissioner? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Clark, if you're referring to the fact that there's been some allegations that Fiat Chrysler has been involved in similar uh, activities. I don't know anything about that and we'll just have to watch whatever potential enforcement action EPA might be taking. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to make this, I mean, it's unfortunate. I just um, been hearing that and it seems like it's, you know, our American car companies are having some of the same issues, so unfortunately. I said, unfortunately, it appears that some of our American car companies are having some of the same issues. Thank you. Representative Beckerfin. Uh, real quick, just wanted to clarify that the trustee, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. <laughs> um, the trustee would also have to approve that the administrative costs, whatever they are, are reasonable as well. Commissioner. Yes, Mr. Chairman, that's exactly correct. We'll have to. We'll have to document and uh, verify that those are legitimate costs. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you for being here today. We appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, yep. Thank you Mr. Chairman.